Okay, guys, well, buy my watch out at 6.32. So mindful and appreciative of everyone's time. It's a public holiday here in Singapore tomorrow. So we don't want to keep you for any longer than we need to. Um, so we might kick off formally while everyone else um, just finds their way in. So first and foremost, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, this, I think, will be a really great webinar. For everyone who joined part one, thank you. Uh, this is part two. If you didn't join us for part one, don't worry, you haven't missed, uh, you know, it's not like part two, it's not going to make sense. Um, I really think you get a lot out of tonight with Nick, who I'll introduce shortly. Um, but just by a very brief way of introduction, uh, my name is Jared Brown. I'm a senior advisor with GFC here in Singapore. And tonight we're really here to look at where should we be positioning our investments? What are the opportunities for obviously the remainder of 2021? but how should we be positioning for 2022? Um, so we've got Evergrande in China, we've got uh, geopolitical tensions in every which direction you look. We've got COVID loosening, tightening in different countries. So what should we be looking at uh, when it comes to investments? That's exactly what we're gonna to touch on tonight. Before we get into it, our standard disclaimer, which we must obviously cover, everything that we run through tonight is general information only. It is not personal advice. These are not recommendations made for you. So if you do want to discuss your situation, reach out to your advisor. If you don't already have an advisor, then reach out to us. We'd obviously be very happy to line you up with someone very suitable within the GFC team. Uh, now, before I introduce Nick, just by a very brief uh, background on GFC, um, we've got a bit of an Australian theme going tonight, which naturally I love. Um, I'm from Perth myself, Global Financial Consultants originally started uh, back in the late 90s in Sydney before being brought out to Singapore in the early 2000s. So a lovely Australian connection there. We are now one of the oldest, longest standing, uh, non-aligned advisory firms in Singapore. So, uh, and in fact, in Asia. So something we're really proud of for any Australians on the call or, or for anyone who's followed the Royal Commission, naturally not being owned by a bank or an insurance company is a pretty good thing in this environment. So certainly something we're very proud of. We work with expats all over the world now um, in many, many countries. So something we do day in, day out um, and naturally work with people like Nick and other professionals in this space when we're looking at how to manage money and how things are gonna work across borders um, and obviously multi-jurisdictional advice. So that is it on us. I'm going to pass over to Nick shortly, just by way of very brief background. Uh, Nick is a fellow Australian. So for anyone who feels the need to jump off the call, you're free to do so now. But naturally, I think it's gonna be wonderful. Um, an incredibly intelligent uh, finance expert, the chief investment officer with Vantage Point Asset Management currently. It's been with Eastspring, Prudential, uh, very, very diverse and thorough background in this space. Um, and we're incredibly pleased and privileged to have him on the call with us tonight. So Nick, I'll pass over to you and um, let you take it from there and tell us where we should be all putting our money. Yeah, uh, thanks very much, Joe. Um, what I might do is just, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, sorry, oh, did I share that? sharing the screen. I'll just make that to the full screen, excuse me. What, I, what I'll run through tonight, I was actually just working on, we, I had a, a slightly different presentation from um, that we were going to present a couple of weeks ago. And again, apologies for those of you, um, we had some technical difficulties on that night from, from my end. Um, what we try and do, I don't have a um, forecast-based approach when I'm looking at investments. What we try and do is, rather than trying to forecast what might go right, we try and work out what is probably wrong. And so what I typically do at the start, at this time of the year, is come up with a set of non-predictions uh, for the following year. Um, 
and I'll, I'll come back to this. Uh, I'll come back to the sort of where the vulnerability is and and where the upside is. But just around a couple of the non predictions that we're looking at, where we see you know some significant asymmetry in markets or, or dislocations, if you like. Um, and, and Jared touched on one in the introduction. It's really, in, it, firstly, in the high yield market, where you've got US high yield credit spreads at an extremely narrow level. So basically back at where they were um, near the trough prior to both the previous recent crises. In contrast, um, Asian high yield credit spreads or the risk premium that you get rewarded for for taking on high yield credit um, in the Asian markets is actually at almost a record wide. It's gone back to where it was almost at the height of the pandemic. Um, so that's set up a pretty interesting relative value opportunity. Now, of course, when you're buying high yield in the, in, and, and it is junk bond credit, clearly there's a risk of default and that's what the high yield, the very wide high yield spread is telling you. And it's important to understand that 40% of the Asian high yield market is actually in Chinese real estate. And that's clearly been affected by the um, impending default of um, China's second largest property developer, Evergrande, which Jared mentioned. Um, and spill over into um, other Chinese developers as well. So that's had a big impact on the, on the Asian high yield market. Nonetheless, if I, if I jump forward to this slide, which shows you the relative spread between Asia and the US, it's at a pretty extreme level. And what I've done with the, with the spread here, by the way, is, is um, what statisticians call um, normalization. So we've done a Z score. Uh, for, for, for those of you who think back to first year statistics um, to, to, to normalize the two spreads. And what you can see the light blue line is the Asian high yield spread. And that's almost a four standard deviation event in, in terms of how wide it is versus its historic average. Whereas you can see the dark blue line, which is the US high yield is almost back at trough levels. Most of the time they actually tend to move together. So, this is a really interesting opportunity um, potentially coming over the next 12 months. As I said, it's not without risk because 40% of that light blue line is China real estate. And in, from our perspective, that is a genuine problem. Now, when we're looking at, uh, and, and what I might do now is just jump ahead and uh, with a couple of charts on that, Overall, China debt, private sector credit or debt relative to GDP, it's just under 230% of GDP in China, which is the dark blue line on the left-hand side of this chart. Or oh, sorry, the left-hand side of this page. The light blue line is the equivalent private sector credit to GDP in Japan. And you can see that China's private sector credit relative to GDP has now surpassed where Japan was back in the 19, early 1990s. Um, and you can see the acceleration since the great financial crisis in 2009 um, has been quite extreme. So the level of debt in China is, is, is at a non-trivial level. And by the way, if we did the same chart for Spain or Ireland or other real estate bubbles, that have occurred over the last decade or so, uh, Thailand in 1997, um, they all roughly peaked at about a bit over 200% of debt to GDP. So what this, what this suggests to us is that there is a genuine leverage problem or excess credit problem in China. And if we go back a page, the, the chart on the left here shows the rate of change in credit growth um, on a year on year basis, which is again, the dark blue line light blue line on the left hand side is the rate of change in real estate prices in China, or real estate sales, I should say. And so you can see when credit is accelerating, um, that tends to lead to an, uh, a rise in real estate sales. And when credit's contracting or slowing, 
that leads to a slowdown in real estate sales. And over the last 12 months, since October 2020, there's been a significant slowdown in credit, in the availability of credit um, in China. And from our perspective, that's had a, a big influence on the problem that's now occurring in the real estate sector in that it, it's been a genuine tightening of credit. But obviously, if we go back to this previous chart, there's been a significant buildup over time. So if the authorities continue to allow credit to build up, the problem would become even greater. And, and so that's, that's why they appear to have decided to, to try and slow that down. I think the good news if, is if you go back to, to previous um, slowdowns over the last decade, the slowdown in credit so far is very, very similar to what we've seen already um, or, or, or where it's troughed previously. So if anything, we would actually expect it to probably improve again over the next 12 months. So again, that may be an opportunity to look at both Asian high yield credit um, credit in the region more broadly, notwithstanding the fact that there will be some genuine defaults in, in, in the real estate sector. But the chart on the right-hand side is also there to show that the acceleration, deceleration in credit also has an influence on equity valuation in China as well. Um, and, and the light blue line on the right-hand side is the price to earnings multiple in China. And so when, again, when credit's accelerating, people want to pay more for equity, ironically. And then when credit decelerates or, and growth decelerates, people um, demand a higher risk premium or a lower PE ratio for, for the equity. So again, we think that that's probably an opportunity as well at some point, although, um, if you look at the chart on the right-hand side, the, the valuation hasn't yet got back to sort of trough levels yet, even though we've seen this significant slowdown in, in growth and in, and in credit. So it is still plausible that there is more risk to be priced in um, um, in China equity and, 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 and a little bit in China credit, although I think the China credit side is, you know, already at a pretty extreme level. So. That's something that's very, very interesting. I think if we turn to, I won't, I won't talk about the second point yet because I don't have any data there, but um, something else we've been thinking about is one of the big concerns going into next year and, and, and the risks for 2020 is that central banks globally and particularly the, the major central bank, the US Federal Reserve, um, and, and the reason why I say that that's the most important is because US interest rates still drive the US dollar and, and, and dollar liquidity, and therefore the Fed is, is still the most important central bank. So as the Fed gets closer to normalizing, we expect them to, I, I, I just said I don't forecast, but we, we do expect them to um, likely start tapering their balance sheet from, from tonight, um, uh, Asia time, and then start to raise rates probably by the middle of next year, that as that withdrawal of liquidity starts to, 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 to draw closer and interest rates start to rise, that historically has led to a, a greater volatility in, in asset prices generally. But I think the assets that are most vulnerable are, are, are either assets or, or, or equities that are very, very levered. So we would be concerned about companies that have negative free cash flow, um, high balance sheet leverage, and um, growth that's way off into the future. Um, and so we're, we're particularly focused on the tech sector because that's where um, lots of the non-profitable parts of the stock market are. In contrast, profitable tech has actually got very, very strong cash flow, very strong balance sheets. So although I think stocks like Microsoft and Apple and Amazon, um, the major US tech stocks are trading at pretty lofty valuation multiples. What they do have is strong free cash flow and net cash on balance sheet. So we wouldn't be worried about the major tech, tech stocks um, in a general sense. But where we think the risk lies is, is definitely in the non-profitable tech. Um, and that would be in the types of stocks again, that, that 
um, if some of you have heard of an ETF called ARC, it's the type of companies that they own, we would be more cautious on, at least tactically in the short run, or while the Fed is reducing liquidity and raising interest rates. Um, where we see an opportunity to hedge the rise in interest rates is actually in, in Asian banks or Asia Pacific banks. Um, and, and by Asia Pacific, I mean Asia, including Australia and New Zealand. Um, and we've actually got a long position there in a basket of 50 banks in, in, in Asia. The reason we like banks is for, for a couple of reasons. Um, number one, if we, if we screen the universe, uh, sorry, I'll stay on this page. This is our, our broad valuation um, screen that we use for markets globally. And what you'll notice is on the right, far right hand side, the earnings yield um, on Asia Pacific banks is almost 14%. Now, the way you calculate the earnings yield is a concept of similar to the dividend yield, but, but it's, it's all of the earnings yield. So it's one divided by the price to earnings ratio. Now, the earnings yield is sort of a proxy for the forward looking return. So the earnings yield on Asia Pacific banks is almost 14%. In other words, the P ratio is about seven times. It's a very, very cheap sector um, from a valuation standpoint. And you can see it's actually the cheapest sector on our screen there. Now, the other important point is that banks tend to make more profits when interest rates rise and, and when the yield curve steepens um, because they, they borrow short and lend long. So they, their net interest margin is based on, on higher interest rates. So therefore, when you look at the performance of banks, whether, whether this is in Asia Pacific or Europe, or, or just globally generally, they will tend to trade with the movement in interest rates. And you can see that in the chart on the left-hand side of page 12, um, which I've, I'm showing, showing here. So the performance of the Asia Pacific Bank Index is highly correlated or directionally, or moves in the same direction as the US 10-year yield. So as yields rise and interest rates rise, um, that tends to, um, you boost the performance of, of, of bank equity. Um, and it's because they become more profitable if interest rates rise. Um, so banks are not only inexpensive, they trade on a low PE ratio or a high earnings yield. They, they offer some protection if interest rates rise. So it's a diversifier in your portfolio. Um, and then the other important point as well is the the payout ratio tends to be quite high. So the dividend yields on, on the Asia Pacific Bank Index and specifically the basket of Asia banks we, we've got in our, in our portfolio um, is over 5%. In fact, it's almost 6%. So th that's actually quite an, an interesting dividend yield, particularly if you've got um, uh, an, in, an income requirement. So again, that's something interesting for investors not only getting a, a decent dividend yield in a very low interest rate environment, but you're getting some protection in the case of interest rates rising. Um, and, and, and that basket more recently has performed quite well, particularly through October, as yields started to rise again. And then banks, of course, as well, also will, interest rates tend to rise when, when the economy is doing better and, and growth and profits start to rise. So, Banks are a key cyclical sector and the performance of cyclically orientated equity or companies that tend to benefit when the, when the profit cycle or the growth cycle improves also tend to be correlated to interest rates. And again, that's shown on the right hand side. Um, so that's a key sector that we, that, that, that we like as well. Um, and then I think you know, just, just generally um, the, the difference between the earnings yield that you can get on Asian equity, Asia Pacific equity and US interest rates or, or interest rates generally. So US, uh, Asia, most Asian markets are tied to US interest rates. Um, 
tends to mean that the, the performance of Asian equity, um, well, the, the, the risk compensation that you get in Asian equity is considerably better than it is in, in fixed income. So that, that suggests that the medium term return should favour equity over fixed income. And, and again, if we, if we go to our, our broad valuation screen, you can see that interest rates on the, on the far left-hand side are very, very expensive. And what we mean by that is that once you take away inflation, um, the real interest rate is actually negative. And so if you hold a sovereign bond to maturity, um, you, you'll actually lose money after inflation. Um, so again, a reason to own equity over, over fixed income, or at least some equity over fixed income, is to, uh, is to provide some inflation protection. Um, with a caveat that when inflation becomes very, very high, it is also a problem for equity as well. And, and again, I, I mentioned that in particular, long duration equity or equity that has growth and profits way off into the future. So that, that's the the part of the equity market that'd be most vulnerable. Um, and that's probably the, you know, the, that is the critical risk. I think, you know, for, for investors, what many of investors have historically done is also used bonds or fixed income as the di diversification for their equity portfolio. And that's broadly worked um, over the last decade or more, but, if we do move into a, a regime um, over the next few years where interest rates and inflation start to rise again, um, then fixed income may be more challenged as, as a diversification for your equity portfolio as well. So, you know, that's something to consider as well as, as a client. Um, that A, you're not going to earn very much, uh, particularly after inflation, but B, also your fixed income in your portfolio is less likely to diversify your equity um, in, in, a, in a rising inflation environment. Um, so, you know, that's something very, very important to consider. Um, and then the final one there for um, any antipodeans in the, in the um, you know, one of my other non-predictions is that England will, will not retain the ashes in 2022. Um, I might get some protest on that. Um, so something, something we also like to do is not only think about the downside risk, and I've talked, you know, in um, strategists and portfolio managers and um, people that talk about finance, usually think about downside risk. Um, and, 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 that's, and that's warranted. That's part of our job as a, as a fiduciary. But what we should also do is think symmetrically about risk. And what is the upside risk? And I think from a positive point of view, if we're thinking optimistically about 2022, is that equity markets tend to continue to outperform while, while the macro cycle or the growth cycle is continuing to improve. And that's, that's reasonable odds, given that we've only just started the macro cycle in, in March, 2020. The second point, which relates to um, what I was just talking about, the equity risk premium or the difference between what you can earn on equity versus what you can earn on fixed income is a, a, still abnormally high. And to put numbers around that, the the earnings yield on, on, on equity is, is more than five percentage points higher than what you would earn on, on sovereign fixed income or most sovereign fixed income. And thirdly, um, policy is still exceptionally loose. So even when the Fed talks about tapering the balance sheet tonight and potentially starting to raise interest rates in the middle of next year, they're taking policy from an extremely accommodative level. In fact, the most accommodative in history. And, that, and that's also true of fiscal policy as well. And then thirdly, I, I talked about um, how we think there's considerable value in Asia Pacific banks. Asia Pacific banks um, are 
at a 50% discount to the broader market. And as we said, provide some hedge for a rise in interest rates. So that's something we're definitely very, very bullish on um, going into next year. And then, and then the fifth point there we've discussed as well is that there's some interesting episodic value in, in Asian credit, um, particularly high yields. No, but as I, you know, I would caveat that that, that is not without risk. Um, but but something to something to 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 have a think about if you if you want to take on that risk. And then I think from a longer term perspective, something that's very very interesting, and, and all of you would likely be aware that have there have been investors, but the U.S. stock market has been the best performing stock market for over a decade now. Um, and in fact, when we look at when we look at the Asian stock markets versus, versus the US. This is the, the chart on the left here shows MSCI Asia Pacific on a price to book value basis. So the relative value compared to the US stock market, it's at the biggest discount since SARS in 2002 and since the Asian crisis. Um, and any of you who've been around for that for that long would remember that the Asian crisis in particular was pretty extreme in this part of the world. Um, and, and, and certainly SARS was as well. And, and obviously 2001, 2002 also was a US recession at the time. Um, but you can see over the next decade, the Asian equity actually outperformed the US by, uh, or re-rated, sorry, versus US um, quite considerably and, and, and outperformed on a, on a, on a very um, a, on, a, on, a, on a large basis. Um, so this the relative valuation. So what's that? What, what that is saying is over the next decade, for, from our perspective, you're more likely to get a higher return um, from equities in this region than you are in the US. It's, it's not a bearish view on the US, it's just saying that, that the value opportunity or the relative value opportunity or the relative future return opportunity is probably much greater in Asia Pacific looking forward. Um, and Asia also trades at a, a discount to Europe, although less so um, simply because Europe is also trading at a discount to the US. Now, to be fair, I should caveat this, that if you look at, the reason why the US has outperformed, it, it, it has been genuine over the last 10 years. In other words, the US has outperformed because it's had superior profit growth compared to Asia Pacific. But again, that valuation discount is now so large that, that it's actually interesting to, to consider having a, a greater weight to Asia Pacific equity versus, versus US equity looking forward. Um, probably the, the, the final point I might touch on, I, you know, we, we had a, we also suggest that volatility in the currency market is quite low. And that was one of the, the first time predictions that, that, that currency volatility would not remain low or, or not go back to a prior trough. Something we focus on a lot is the direction of the US dollar. And that's because it does tend to drive the performance of Asian, Asian equity and also or Asian assets more broadly and, uh, and, and emerging market assets. And, and something interesting at the start of the year, the consensus belief or the, the overwhelming consensus was that the US dollar was going to, de to depreciate. And when you look at the chart on the left-hand side, the US dollar actually troughed on about the 2nd of January and the US dollar has actually broadly trended up for, for most of this year. And not coincidentally, um, that was roughly when the, the peak in, in Asian equity occurred was, was actually in February, so not long after that trough in the US dollar. So generally, when the US dollar was rising, um, that tends to be more challenging for um, EM, EM and Asian assets and vice versa. During a global recovery, you'll often see US dollar weakness as US investors allocate out of US assets or domestic assets um, into offshore assets. Um, and also the other reason for that relationship is 
a large proportion of the world still borrow money in US dollars. So when, when the US dollar is depreciated, effectively that cost of borrowing is going down and vice versa. When, when the dollar is strengthening, it makes it more expensive to borrow in US dollars and therefore that tightens, tightens dollar liquidity. Another factor that's been driving the US dollar more recently um, is actually been the, the interest rate differential between the US and, and the rest of the world. And that's really been around improving US growth compared to the rest of the world. And the chart on the right-hand side shows real interest rates, or sorry, the difference between real interest rates in the US, real interest rates in Germany, and the performance of the US dollar. And real interest rates in the US have been rising in relative terms or improving the, the return on US dollars compared to most other currencies. Um, that said, something that's interesting, again, for, is, um, for, for any Australians listening, um, we actually think that the um, Australian dollar is actually probably materially undervalued based on where um, current commodity prices are for most commodities that Australia exports. The one caveat there would be iron ore, which um, is obviously a key commodity, particularly for Western Australia, um, as Jared and I discussed, discussed offline. And there's a, the, there is an important linkage between iron ore and China real estate because a key component in China real estate or China construction is obviously steel. Um, and a key input into steel is iron ore. Um, so it's an obvious point, but the, the recent episode in, in China, the slowdown in, and the slowdown in, in the weakness in China real estate um, has contributed to the weakness that we've seen in iron ore as well. On the positive side, we do, you know, longer term, I would argue that, as I said, the Australian dollar looks inexpensive, not just the Australian dollar, but the Canadian dollar, the New Zealand dollar, um, the, the, the NOKI, so other commodity currencies as well, look very cheap versus their underlying commodity prices or the income they receive from those, from those commodity prices. So that's something interesting. Um, I'd also point out that um, on iron ore specifically, the major iron ore producers, um, BHP Rio Fortescue in Australia, and this is true of Vale in Brazil, roughly have a cost structure of about um, $30 a tonne. So even at $100 a tonne, they're, they're generating incredibly large free cash flow. So we still have some exposure to that in, in our underlying um, equity portfolio. But just to conclude on that in terms of the other, the other ideas, a, the first basket of equity that we have uh, has a quality bias. So when we screen for equities in our portfolio, we look for companies with high free cash flow, low balance sheet leverage, and sustainable dividend yield and growth. And we call that Gary or growth at a reasonable yield. This, the second basket we talked about at length, which is Asia Pacific banks. The third basket, which we think is interesting, um, is actually technology in Asia. And, and again, that's an interesting relative value opportunity. So the major technology companies in Asia Pacific, in Asia, sorry, I, sh I should say, um, are primarily in China, Korea, and Taiwan uh, in terms of the markets. Um, and, and there's been a significant episode, particularly in the Chinese stocks, which is related not only to what I was discussing earlier in terms of the slowdown in credit in China and slowdown in growth, but some of you would be aware that there's been a, a regulatory crackdown by the Chinese authorities on the major technology companies as well. Um, and we, we've actually taken that as an opportunity and we've started to buy into that. And specifically the two Chinese names that we own in the portfolio are um, Alibaba and Tencent. And that's partly because they were first in terms of having that impact, that regulatory impact on them. Um, but more broadly, or secondly, we now think they're materially undervalued. And then thirdly, um, they're very, very strong platform companies and still have a, still incredibly profitable despite what, what the Chinese regulator has done. 
the, the other parts of, the, uh, of our Asian technology basket, mainly focused in Taiwan and Korea, um, uh, uh, we, we have companies like TSMC, um, Taiwan Semiconductor, um, Sam, Samsung, um, um, SK Hynix. So um, we have quite a lot of uh, semiconductor exposure. And one of, one of the issues in the global supply chain, which many of you have probably read about, is the shortage of semiconductor chips as well. And while historically semiconductors have been um, fairly cyclical um, part of the, of, of, of the supply chain in the global uh, equity universe, um, the, there is a secular demand for semiconductor chips as well. Um, and in those companies I just mentioned, um, are, are probably the best in the world at making them. Um, or among the best in the world. So we, we, we see some secular demand there. And then, then again, what we've done with that basket, similar to our others, our other baskets mentioned above, um, we focused on companies with high free cash flow, decent valuation, and strong um, low balance sheet leverage. Um, so our companies, our, our basket in aggregate actually has net cash on balance sheet. So it's a very, very robust balance sheets. Um, all of that said, um, given, given the risk around the impending tightening in interest rates or the pull forward of the, the rise in interest rates, withdrawal of US liquidity, um, probably starting tonight, um, we have had some hedging in place as well. And that's what that, that short position there is. It's a, it's a hedge against our um, other equity exposure. So our, our overall equity exposure is just under 15, sorry, just under 50% long, long exposure. Um, I think I can probably stop, stop there, Jared. I'm happy to take some questions. I think it's, is it, looks like there's one in the... Yeah, no, look, no worries at all, Nick. But um, yeah, really, really, really appreciate it. I think that's probably given everyone plenty of food for thought. Um, we've got a few questions that have come through, through the chat, through the Q&A, through email. So uh, let's let's just tackle them in a, in a bit of a random order, if you like. They are a bit all over. Um, right. nothing, nothing that I think will throw you off. So <laughs> let's just fire away. Um, okay, so hard one. first question, <laughs> sorry. Oh, just looking at the one on Tesla. That's the hard one, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah we'll, we'll get to that one. Um, right. Look, let, let's start with a, a, a bit of a, I guess, broad strategy question. I mean, you've mentioned quite a bit throughout the presentation that, you know, the focus at the moment uh, from a you know, fund level, the investments you're looking at is on strong free cash flow. So the question is, you know, why, why would you not always look at businesses with strong free cash flow? And surely that would make logical sense that they would be good businesses to consistently invest in. Is there a reason you would look at that, you know, more at one time and less in another? How, you know, how do you sort of yeah. think about that? Well, look, philosophically, I think it makes sense over the longer term that, that, that those companies will, over the medium term, over the cycle, they will outperform. And, and certainly our work on creating the baskets that, growth at a reasonable yield basket or, or Gary, as we like to call it. Um, particularly over the last 12 months, that's that's performed very, very well in relative terms, as, as well as, as, in a, is, as in an absolute sense. But while um, during the during phases when liquidity is plentiful and interest rates are very, very low, well, the, the discount rate is very, very low. Actually, um, unprofitable companies or growth companies will actually tend to outperform, and and we've a we've actually seen that. And probably, um, you, you know, Tesla is a micro example. Of, well, it, it's a complex example of that. But the 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 area of the you know, so for example, um, Kathy Wood's Arc ETF is over the last few years has performed incredibly well. And those, the, the, the stocks in our innovation ETF um, have been growth stocks 
but they haven't they haven't had a they haven't, they haven't had competition from um, traditional companies because the, the the broader growth cycle is weak. So when when growth is scarce globally, you investors will tend to have a preference for where they can get growth, and that and that's been in in those types of companies. Um, but also those companies are not penalised by a high interest rate. So if interest rates are higher, or put it another way, if, if you've done a net, if you think of a net, it's going back to first principles, but if you think of a net present value calculation, if you raise the discount rate on long duration cash flows into the future, that, that, that reduces the, 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 the current value of those future cash flows. Um, but while the interest rate remains low or the discount rate remains low, the taken to the logical extreme, you can um, the the value of those cash flows is is almost infinite, and that's almost what's been happening. Um, and and then there's a there's a momentum element with that as well. Um, capital capital has followed capital, um, so it's been flow into into those sectors. But <clears throat> I'd, I'd probably say that the main factor behind it is. Well, the two main factors. One, growth growth has been um, growth has been scarce, and therefore people have looked for where they could find growth. Um, and then, secondly, the discount rate, probably as a result of the first part, was very very low, and therefore those growth companies were not penalised from that. Mm. Um, when interest rates are high, if you have got a lot of balance sheet leverage as well, that can become a problem. Um, and so even though the, the discount rate is obviously not high today anywhere globally, but the interest rate that Chinese high yield companies have to pay is extremely high. And then that's caused a problem. So if, if central banks start to put up the, the general level of interest rates, um, that can become a problem for highly levered companies. So I would just put the, in there that, you know, we're not negative on growth companies per se, but we're negative on growth companies that have weak free cash flow and high balance sheet leverage, and also very, very expensive valuation. Mm -hmm. So that basket I was talking about that we've been working on <clears throat> on the short side and, and as, as a hedge is we're basically doing the complete, the, the exact opposite almost of what we do with our Gary process, where we screen the universe for companies with negative free cash flow high balance sheet leverage and very expensive valuation. And we call that basket hope at a ridiculous multiple um, or harm. And, and so we've created that as a hedge, but you could, um, you know, the, the, there is other ways to hedge, but for, for, for clients that can't do that sort of thing, and obviously that's something you can, um, more sophisticated investors or hedge funds would do. Um, something it, it, it's probably just that if you've made very very good profits on those type of companies and i put i'd probably put tesla in that that bucket although it obviously has some profits today i'd say that the you pay for those profits are, are, are quite expensive that if you've been long those type of companies you've done exceptionally well um, now that we're moving into a higher interest rate environment or likely to be moving into a higher interest rate environment that you start to take profit on, on some of those companies at the very least, or you'd be more cautious. Um, but I think you're absolutely right. Over the medium term, um, those attributes should perform better. That makes sense. All right, well, let's let's naturally flow into the, the very simple question of, and you've probably already sort of skirted around the edges a little bit here, but. Let's just ask it directly as it's been asked by one of our attendees. Is Tesla a good long-term bet? Are we going to see $2,000 or even $3,000? Look, it's, it's a great question. It, it, Tesla, Tesla would have been a very, very, it's clearly been a very, very challenging stock for people that have tried to short it. Um, and, and, and it's performed exceptionally well. Um, but when you consider the, 
plausibility around their valuation. Um, basically, the company is implying that it's worth more than the, the entire rest of the global car market, um, which seems Im implausible. And now, now that the advocates for Tesla would argue that that it's um, just a car company, it's it's a technology company as well. But I would still argue that the that the that the multiples are implausible. Um, and and then there's the other risks ar around the stock as well, um, whether that's uh, regulatory risk or 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 ju just simply competition. So if you if you just think generally as a consumer, would you, and this is just my personal preference, would you prefer a, a car made by Porsche, an equivalent EV, or, or one by Tesla? I, I would argue that the Porsche product is probably superior. That's just to use one example, but the, they will they'll likely face significant competition there. So um, it, it yes, it could easily. Keep keep going, but I I would say it's it it's likely to be challenged at some point, and and I, I would caveat this that I'm I'm not an individual stock picker, and um, um and I'm not a, a specialist on the, on that particular sector or that particular stock, but that that'd be my general observation. I'd also say that, again, if interest rates rise, then then that that would be a a challenge for their long duration cash flows into the future. Mm -hmm. They'd be in that category as well, although not as extreme as the non-profitable tech in that they do have some cash flow and profits now. Brilliant. Well, hopefully that's answered that one. Um, and now I should just say anyone who has any additional questions, pop them in the Q&A, pop them in the chat box. We've got both running. Uh, we've still got a few more questions to get through, but you know, fire them through as and when you think of them. Um, so, all right, next question. Let's change scope a little bit. You've mentioned um, a few times throughout, we're going to, to enter an, a rising interest rate environment. You mentioned fixed income, bond funds may not be as uncorrelated as we might like. But, you know, I guess at the same time, you know, if we, if we think to our sort of ASIC, our MAS compliance uh, regime, we need to have some defensive exposure. So outside of identifying lower risk equities, what should we be looking at in the defensive bucket? You know, the fixed income, convertible preference shares, convertible notes, cash. You know, where are we going to going to generate a positive real return, or is that something we should just be giving up on at the moment? It, it's a really, really challenging one. You can see. Look, I'm I'm obviously less constrained in, in my fund. I can run a, um, um, you know, it, it is an Asian macro fund. Mm -hmm. So what you'll notice on the page 20 is I don't have any fixed income at all. Um, so, so that kind of answers you if you're an unconstrained investor. But I think even, even as a, even as a, someone that has to follow the, the, those, those obligations, I think thinking about um, credit that is shorter in duration, at least you've got some protection. So investment grade credit that's of high quality, that's giving you a modest amount of additional spread, um, but is somewhat offensive. Obviously credit tends to be a little bit more correlated to equity compared to sovereign bonds. But I it's, it's a difficult one because it's not obvious that we've changed that the regime has shifted yet, um, and we've and by the way, the regime really. When I say the regime, the regime's been going since Volcker in 1980. So we've broadly been so the very few people that have actually been working in the industry, including myself, back back that far. But in the prior regime, prior to Volcker, that was actually a very very challenging period for. Uh, for, fit, for fixed income. It wasn't great for equity either, but what helped you in the prior regime, and what I mean by the prior regime, the regime from sort of 1965 to 1980, um, 
was a commodities, so having come on some commodity exposure, I'd be reluctant to do that now because of the strong performance of commodities. And we can come back to that. Um, gold could still be a hedge against that. And in a period from 1971, when gold was, uh, or the peg of Bretton Woods was broken by Ritz, uh, Nixon, or the end of the gold standard, I should say, um, gold went from $35 to 666 in September 1980, roughly 1,700% over that period. Um, it was a genuine hedge for, um, you know, during the high inflation regime. And commodities did a similar amount. But what, what did hedge you through that period, putting those two, or putting commodities aside, was was dividends. Dividends actually, so companies that can grow their dividends or have pricing power um, did actually hedge you against inflation uh, uh, over that period. So again, that's something to think about. Um, the, the other one um, is possibly the private credit space and, and whether, you, um, whether you have some funds that, can, that, that work in that space. Um, one of our main clients is, um, and again, this is not a recommendation, um, but, but our, one of our main clients in Australia, which we run a, a hedge for, um, and I'll come back to what that hedge is, um, is a private credit fund called Merix. Um, and Merix is based out of Melbourne. Um, and their, their returns over the last five years have been around 10% per annum. Um, in the private credit space. So that's basically the space where the banks have stepped back from lending to developers and, and um, other mezzanine type debt. Um, they've got a very low loan to valuation ratio on, on that credit, uh, about 45% or something like that. Um, and also they're, in the, they're lending in the agri space, the agri, agricultural credit space. Um, and their fund, I think is between two and $3 billion. They're fairly large manager in that space. What we're actually doing for them is a, is a hedge on that portfolio as well. And the way we've hedged the portfolio for them is to buy protection in credit default swaps. Now, credit default swap is just very simply an insurance policy. So if the credit of the underlying deteriorates, the value of the credit default swap goes up. So if any of you have seen the big short, they were buying credit default swaps. And we've bought credit default swaps for Merix on the Australian banks, on the Sovereign, and on what they call the ITRAX, which is a broad basket of Australian credit. Um, so in the event, and we're not suggesting that there will be a problem, but if there is a problem, the value of that insurance policy will go up, or the value of the credit default swap will go up, and that'll provide some protection to, to the Merix portfolio. And so, again, that's another way you could look at, you know, that's another way we're looking at, but it's not something that, that, um, that retail investors can do on their own. That makes sense. No, I think that, that covers that one well. Um, all right, so shifting back to equities and uh, perhaps more on a sort of slightly positive note, perhaps, um, Alibaba, Tencent, obviously you've mentioned, you know, key focus, at the moment, um, naturally, you know, as you highlighted tonight, a bit of regulatory pressure. We've now got Evergrande, a bit of a negative bent towards China as far as the Western media is concerned. Yeah. Um, we've seen a few headlines out of the likes of you know, Motley Fool, for example, suggesting that it's now becoming more difficult, even some suggesting it's too hard to quantify the risk of the Chinese government. Whereas you know, then we're getting people like yourself and perhaps some of the funds, the investors who are actually more familiar with Asia, with Chinese markets, who are seeing this as a tremendous buying opportunity. So are we just going through a period of Western ignorance? Is this going to be a period we look back on in five years time and think why on earth were we not buying these companies at ridiculously low valuations? I mean, in some ways, you know, the page we're on probably kind of answers some of that. But, you know, what's your view, I guess, with, with that sort of disparity that we're seeing? Yeah, it, look, it, it's not a straightforward one because 
the, the first point is I don't necessarily think that all of it's priced and I'll come back to a way of helping investors to simply frame that. Um, um, probably the... Oh, my, oh, sorry, let me just... No, that's right, my screen. Oh, you got it? Yep. I, yeah, got it back. <clears throat> I'll go back to the relevant page. The, the most relevant page, page nine, the chart here is the what I like to call it. The dark blue line, as I mentioned, is they, it's a fancy way of describing it is a credit impulse. But simply, that just means the rate of change in credit flow. Is credit accelerating or decelerating? When credits accelerate, um, that tends to be good for growth, um, and the valuation multiple tends to go up. And then when credit's decelerating, um, it tends to be bad for growth. People worry about growth and the, the valuation multiple tends to go down. Now, the good news is the credit impulse has already been very, very weak over the last 12 months. Um, and I actually think this is, I wouldn't say more important than the regulatory risk, but it's certainly been um, at least half of the problem. Um, in terms of why China's underperformed this year. I think um, MSCI Asia Pacific is, is basically flat on the year. China's down about 14%. China's from the peak in February is down about 28% or something like that. So it's been a bad, poorly performing market. And that's had a big impact on Asia because it's about 40% of Asia overall. So, so it's, and that's MSCI China. So. Hong Kong listed China stocks effectively. Um, so the good news is the credit impulse is already very, very weak. It's basically where it was in 2018 when we we're worried about China growth in 2015, 16, when we we're worried about China growth. Recall in, recall in 2015, there was a great cover on the Economist magazine, which I always use as a contrarian indicator, the great fall of China. Um, and and that was that was that's roughly at the bottom there in 2000 August 2000 sorry September 2015. So all the growth concern about China and the re regulatory concern at the moment, um, I'm not, I wouldn't say it's an, an overreaction because I think some of it's genuine, but I think if, I think it's largely in the price on the regulatory side specifically. Um, again, that's been going on for quite a period of time now. I think initially it, it was a shock and it actually started, recall, when Ant Financial, which is part of Alibaba, tried to float. And that was in October 2020. And, and that's when, um, and, and the reason that came about is, if you think about what the regulatory um, attack has been on it's been on a data so companies that have data or potentially have data risk in the us so china not wanting to share the data and that goes both ways by the way but um secondly it's around the the, the education sector thirdly it's around real estate um and importantly the regulatory crackdown has already affected more than three quarters of the stock market. So almost, well, most of the stock market has already been affected by some form of regulatory crackdown. So I think it's A, well appreciated now and, and, and probably well in the price. Um, but that's not to say that it's not trivial for, um, for, for certain sectors. And, you know, that the, the education, the online education sector specifically was probably had a, an 80% reduction in their future profits. So that's, that's clearly going to affect the valuation of those companies. Um, but it probably doesn't affect the, it shouldn't affect the broad valuation of the, the, the overall stock market. And then specifically on the two, the two companies we like, and there's a couple of others, but, but, but they're, they're the two major ones. A, they were affected first, which I mentioned, mentioned earlier, 
Um, oh, sorry, the, the other important point about Ant Financial is what Jack Ma was suggesting with Ant Financial is that it could become an alternative to the state banking system. And, and Ant at the time, and I'm not sure what share they have of deposits today, but at the time it was about five or 6% of to total deposits in China. So it was a genuine, it was genuine competition to the state banking system. Now, of course, what China likes to do is control the allocation of capital or credit and hence the credit impulse and why I focus on it. But if they lost control of that, then they can't allocate credit and therefore they lose control and they don't want to lose control. And so that was, that was a kind of a key part of the regulatory crackdown. The other really important one is around um, Chinese trend growth and that's around deteriorating demographics. So the Asian population, the shrinking population now um, in China and the increase in education costs were part of that crackdown there as well. Um, so what the authorities were trying to do was reduce the cost of raising a child, essentially. And, and Chinese families spent a lot of money on, on education and raising children. And obviously housing is an important cost component of that as well. So again, that's the crackdown on, on speculative activity in real estate, notwithstanding, in addition to the point that there's a, um, you know, a credit, broader credit bubble that's been going on for a long time. So, but what all of that means is China does have lower trend growth going forward. Um, but again, that's also why we, we like the, why we like the super platforms of Tencent and Alibaba, uh, again, for, for similar reasons that companies like um, Amazon in the US have been very, very successful. They'll continue to get market share and, and, and the adoption of all of that payments and everything else in China has been even greater than it has been in the US. A final related point to that is that in the future, there's gonna be a, a, a China internet and a US internet or centric internet. So you, if you wanna get exposure to the China centric internet, where there is still a lot of potential growth, you're going to have to buy some of some of these stocks, and so I focus on the big, strong platform ones that are robust, have good balance sheets and good cash flow. And by the way, you know Alibaba now is on about 15 times forward earnings. It's not an expensive stock for, for a tech company. Um, Ten cents, a bit more, a bit higher multiple, about 20 times. Um, but those companies have still got gross profit margins not dissimilar to Amazon or Apple, um, you know, 30 to 50% gross profit margins. So they're still incredibly profitable companies despite this regulatory crackdown. So um, that's a long-winded way of saying, you know, we think there's still a decent opportunity there. But, but certainly the, the, there will be some companies within the China stock market which are going to have lower returns going forward. Um, did, sorry, one final point. So you can see on my chart there that the, the good news is the PE multiples come down. So this is the frame of reference you can use. It's not perfect and valuation only tends to work over a longer time frame. But what you can see is that the good news is it's come down from 18 or 19 times to about just under 14 times. The bad news is that in the other growth episodes, it got down to sort of eight to 10 times. So we could still see further derating. Um, but my, my sense is that China probably won't want to have a weak stock market going into the Winter Olympics and, and, and Xi's re-election within the party next year. So again, that's another factor, socio-political factor, which, which might lead to an improvement in credit and an improvement in growth over the next six to nine months. Um, we, we, we could talk about China for, 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 for hours. But. No, wonderful. Look, I, I think that, um, yeah, that certainly gives, gives everyone plenty of context, I think, and answers that question really well. Um, so look, we're, we're just after 7.30, so we might wrap up there or we don't have any more questions that have flown through. So Nick, look, huge thank you for joining us tonight. Um, excellent presentation, really informative.
um, yeah, certainly a lot of data there. I've really enjoyed it and, and found a lot of it really helpful. For everyone who's joined us tonight, um, thank you very much for giving up your Wednesday evening. For everyone in Singapore and various other parts of Asia, have a, a safe and happy public holiday tomorrow. We'll be sending out a copy of the recording. Um, so anyone who has any questions, reach out to your advisor. As I said, if you don't already have an advisor, reach out to us, more than happy to put you in touch with anyone. If you have any questions for Nick, same, you know, more than happy to pass those on. But um, otherwise, thank you very much for joining us, Nick. Again, thank you very much for giving us your time. Um, but otherwise, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll catch up soon. But thank you all very much.